Psalms chapter 8, and we're going to finish up the chapter tonight, starting with verse 26. 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither die, death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the most <coughs> powerful portions of scripture in the Bible, amen? amen? Especially when you're going through trials and tribulations, when you feel like you're going through spiritual war, one of the greatest passages of scripture to encourage and empower us. So we're going to talk about first the Holy Spirit helping us in our weaknesses. Um, I think... One of the things that um, hurts us the most in our Christian walk, the thing that trips us up the most, is knowing how to pray and how to pray effectively. There have, how many times have you, or, or maybe it's just me, but have you ever knelt down to pray and maybe you're distraught Maybe you're brokenhearted. Maybe you're angry. You know, but whatever the situation, you are overwhelmed. And you don't know what to do. You don't know how to battle the situation. You don't know how to approach the situation. And so you kneel down to pray and talk to your father. And you kneel down and you don't know what to say. There have time, been times that I've sat there and just gone, Jesus, 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 help me, Jesus, help me. Jesus. And, and that's about as far as I can go and, and because I don't even know what to pray for. I don't know what to ask God to do in the situation. I'm, I'm clueless. And it's at those times the scripture says that the Holy Spirit steps in to help us. Thank God. And sometimes that's through speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit just kind of takes over and starts speaking to the Father. It's not exclusively. There are times, have you ever been praying and you just start growing deep inside your gut? The, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit even speaks to through us in those situations. Amen? Hold on just a second. <laughs> the 
Thank you. Appreciate it. But there are times that we just, we cannot um, articulate what needs to, and, and when, when you become so distraught or so hurt, there are times that all you can do is just hold your gut and groan. There have been times that I have been so broken hearted and so uh, burdened down that words weren't even enough to be able to speak. And here's the, the great thing. Um, I read this in a commentary and I wanted to, to read it to you. It says, it is God who searches our hearts and he already knows what the mind or thought process of the spirit is because he knows that the spirit makes intercession according to the will of God. Now this is where we sometimes mistake things. We think that this scripture means that when I can't articulate, when I can't think of what I even need to ask God for, that the Holy Spirit reads my heart and mind and just tells God what I need or what I want. Amen? And that's not what's happening. The Holy Spirit knows the situation. And the Holy Spirit knows the will of God. So the Holy Spirit in making intercession for you is not speaking your words. He has become your advocate and he is speaking on your behalf. Much like if you go to court, you don't know the lingo. You don't know all the laws and all the loopholes. But that lawyer gets up there and speaks for you and says things to make your case be what it needs. He doesn't go up there and speak, okay, now this is what I want you to say. And I don't know how to say it, so you're going to say it. But he knows the laws of the court, and he knows what needs to be happening, so he gets up there and takes over. Amen? In your behalf, working for your good, right? And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He prays for us, knowing the will of God for our lives. And so he looks at that situation and says, this is God's will. So, Father... This is what your child is needing to happen. And the Father knows the mind of the Holy Spirit because he knows that the Spirit is seeking the will of the Father. Because the Bible, and I've told you this too so many times, but I want to impress it. When Jesus came, he didn't speak his words. He spoke the words of his Father. He didn't do what he wanted to do. He did what his Father wanted him to do. So now we see the office of the Holy Spirit doing the same thing. The Holy Spirit doesn't pray what he wants to pray. He prays the will of God for us. Isn't it amazing how they all work together in unity? Not one fighting the other, but they all knowing the mind, thought process, and the will of the other work in unity for our good. Would that the church, would that the body of Christ could do the same thing. Working together in unity, not me over you or you over me, but all working for the kingdom of God. With that thought and mind process, if we all came to work for the kingdom, with a thought process that it's not about me and what I want, and it's not about what you and what you want, but we're here to do the will of the Father. Amen. What could the church accomplish? In verses 28 and 30, he talks about um, that God has the ability to work all things for our good. God is sovereign, right? He has all power, he has all authority. And he is able to manage every single aspect of our lives. And even when we're going through times of suffering, 
Even when we're going through times of battle, even when people are coming against us and maybe they're tearing down what we're trying to build up, the Bible says it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing in your life and it doesn't matter what Satan is doing in your life, no matter if it looks like everything has been destroyed around you, maybe everybody has been tearing down your reputation and you think, what am I supposed to do? God, the Bible says God has the ability to work in every aspect of your life, the good and the bad. And he doesn't isolate it and just work over here or work over here, but he's working in everything in our life. He works it all together, much like you make a soup, you know, you don't put the potatoes to cook in this pot and go over here and put some carrots to cook in this pot and put some meat to cook in this pot, but you put it all together. You take the carrots and you take the potatoes and you take the meat and you put it all together to make a good soup, right? And this is what God is doing. And it doesn't make any difference the destruction that happens in your life. It doesn't make any difference the the bad decisions that you make in your life, the error that you bring to your own life, God will take it all. He just takes and scoops it all, the good and the bad, and he mixes it up and works it together, amen? Just like clay, folding it together and picking out the bad, folding it together, picking out the bad, and he makes it and forms it for your good. It says in here that he does this because we are called according to his purpose. And when we are called according to God's purpose, God is going to keep working in our lives so that his purpose can be accomplished. Amen? So when it, you know, there have been so many times when things are happening and I'm wondering, how is God using this? <laughs> How does this accomplish God's purpose in my life? You know? And, and, and it's beyond our ability or our capability to understand how God takes all of that. How does God do it? But he does. And he takes it all. And, and, and the thing, you know, that gets me is even the things that I bring into my life, the destruction that I bring into my life, God doesn't turn his back on me because of it. But he works in spite of it. And, and no matter what I do, how many wrong turns I make, God just keeps working around it to accomplish his purpose. It says in here that there is this chain reaction that he talks about. And he says... Uh, he talks about those he foreknew, predestined, called, justified, glory. And it's like this chain reaction. And there is this big controversy over predestination because some want to say that um, God has predestined Jim to go to heaven, but Daryl doesn't get to go. You know, sorry. <laughs> but that's not how it is. I firmly believe, and might as well go home, Daryl, you're not going. I firmly believe in predestination, but the fact of the matter is, is we are all predestined to be the sons of God. Amen? But even though it is God's will, even though he predestined to be us, all of us to be sons of God, there comes a point in time in our life when we come to enough maturity in our mind that we can understand the things of Christ that he calls us. Yes, we are predestined, but then there comes a time that you are called. Amen? And you feel that drawing of the Holy Spirit. And that's when you come and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You were predestined, but then you had to accept the call to walk into that destiny that had been predestined for you. And once we walk in that call, he says, when we are called, then what does he do? He justifies us. Amen? 
Thank God that we are justified. And one of these days we're going to be glorified. Uh, Paul wanted the Romans to know that what God had started in them, he was not going to stop until he the work that he began. And I don't know if there's anybody here tonight that needs to be reminded. When God started in you, he's not going to stop until he completes it. The only way that what God has predestined for your life will not come to pass is if you refuse the call. Amen? You see, God, God doesn't force it on us. God doesn't do this without us. God works in concert with us to accomplish all this. Morris in his commentary said this, Paul is saying that God is the author of our salvation and that from beginning to end, we are not to think that God can take action only when we graciously give him permission. And thank God for that. Because even during those times when we have rejected him, even those times when we have turned away and walked away from him, just because we're not saying, God work in my life, God bless my life, God increase me, doesn't mean that God stops working on you. Amen? Amen? And sometimes it's not pleasant. Sometimes we kind of wish that when those times that God would leave us alone, right? Because it tends, it tends to make us miserable when we're not right with God and God starts working in our life, you know, we're getting attention from God that we're really not wanting at that time because we know we're not right. And we just kind of wish God would leave us alone, but thank God he doesn't need our permission. And he keeps working on in spite of it. Um, our participation in this uh, plan of eternity is vital and needed because he says in here that he is conforming us to the image of his son. Is there any way that you can be conformed into the image of anything without your uh, participation in that? You know, I mean, um, Merlene can decide to turn one of her granddaughters into a pretty, pretty princess. But if that granddaughter decides she doesn't want to be a pretty, pretty princess and doesn't cooperate, then Marlene's going to be chasing that granddaughter around the house and tackling her and trying to put the pretty, pretty princess dress on her and the crown on her, and she's jerking it off. Amen? Sometimes we do that with God. God is chasing us down and saying, I'm trying to conform you to the image of my son, and we're jerking off what he's trying to put on. We just keep tearing off that robe of righteousness. You know, we, we jerk it off and throw it away. And that crown of life, we take it and we cast it away. And God just keeps chasing us down and saying, but you are predestined. You have been called. And he keeps trying to wrap us in that robe of righteousness. And, and, and thank God sometimes he tackles us down. Amen? Have you ever felt tackled down by God? Thank God for that, because sometimes we're so hard-headed we need that, amen? Not y'all, that's just me. He says in here in 31 and 32, if God be for us, who can be against us? Paul has spent a lot of time in this chapter going to great lengths to tell the Romans um, about how God gave the gift of his son and how there was a plan, even from the time of the law, the Mosaic law, that God had a plan that he had been working on. And that God had gone to great lengths to bring salvation to mankind, even to the point of allowing his own beloved son to be sacrificed. If, if God was willing to stand there and watch his son be crucified. The Bible even said he had to turn his face away from his son. If God allowed him to stay on that cross and be killed for our sakes, what in this world has the power to come against us when God has sacrificed everything? 
even his beloved son for our salvation. Do you think that he will allow anything to come between us and him? Newell says this, our weak hearts prone to legalism and unbelief receive these words with great difficulty. God is for me. We have failed him, but yet he is for us. We are ignorant, but yet he is still for us. We have not brought forth much fruit in our Christian life, but yet he is still for us. And that means everything, guys. The fact that no matter what we do or what we don't do, None of that can take the love of God away from us. You know, it, I've heard parents say, if my child ever does this thing, they will cease to be my child. I will disappear. And that tears me up. Because I don't care what my children or my grandchildren do. I don't care how far they go into sin. I don't care what perverse thing they do. I may not agree with it. I may not condone it. But I will never, ever stop loving them. And I will never, ever turn my back on them. Amen? Amen. And, and, it, and it, it, it tears me.
It doesn't matter what anybody else, who has the right to lay a charge against someone who has been justified, who has been declared not guilty by the greatest judge. Amen? That is being secure in the love of God. I am secure from any charge that can be brought against me. We are secure from all condemnation. If Jesus gave his life for us and rose again on the third day in victory and in power and in authority and in might, and he sits at the right hand of the Father today making intercession, who dare condemn me once I accept the shed blood of Jesus Christ and accept him as my personal Savior? He is sitting right now at the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. Bring your condemnation. It doesn't matter. But we get caught up and wrapped up in the charges that other people bring against us, the condemnation that other people lay upon us. And if I, if you don't get anything else tonight, get this. Nobody has the right. How dare they come against the call of God. It says we are secure in his love no matter what our circumstances, no matter how hard or severe it is. There is nothing that can separate us from his love. He goes on to say that we are more than conquerors through him. Why? Because of everything that we've been talking about. Because I have been preaching. Because I was called. And when I accepted that call, I was justified. And I was made righteous. And I was glorified in his presence. And nothing can be brought against me. No charge, no condemnation. And I have an intercessor that sits at the right hand of the Father. And I have the Holy Spirit making intercession for me when, when my words won't come and my, my thoughts are not enough to be able to speak for myself. When this is what makes us more than a conqueror. Everything that we've just been talking about, everything that we've been studying in the book of Romans, all this comes together like the greatest tapestry ever woven and it makes us not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror. Through myself, no. Through Jesus Christ. Paul was persuaded that neither life or death separate. Now you think about that. Whether I'm dead or I'm living, neither state can, because, you know, it's easy to say, well, maybe death can separate us, but living sometimes can separate us quicker than dying can, amen? amen. But neither death nor life. An angel can't separate you. Any demonic principality or power, spiritual or on this earth, can separate you from God. Nothing that is happening in your present life, nothing that will ever happen in the future in your life, can separate you from God. No matter how high I go and no matter how low I sink in my life, nothing can separate me from God. Nothing that has been created can separate me from God. Nothing that appears to be good and nothing that appears to be evil can separate me from the love of God. What can separate us from the love of God Nothing. And what does this bring you? A conquering ability. If I have, if I know that I have power and authority over life, over death, over principalities, over angels, and no matter what comes, living, dead, evil, good, how can we be anything other than a conqueror in Jesus Christ? It said, this is how I'm, I'm ending tonight. How is the Christian more than a conqueror? We overcome with a greater power, the power of Jesus. We overcome with greater motive, the glory of Jesus. We overcome with a greater victory, losing nothing 
even when we're in battle. We overcome with a greater love, conquering our enemies with love and converting our persecutors with patience. There is absolutely nothing that can come between you and God. You can walk away from him, but still his love remains. Amen. Would you stand tonight? Father, I just want to thank you for your love, which is so great and encompassing that it goes beyond our ability to comprehend how great your love is. Father, I thank you, God, because you keep us wrapped in your love. And Lord, you give, there is nothing that you have not laid at our disposal to make us a conqueror. You have given us everything in our spiritual arsenal so that we can fight any battle that comes our way. Thank you for your son and his shed blood. Thank you for his faithfulness to die on a cross for us. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit that leads and guides and intercedes for us. Lord, I thank you for everything that you do, for everything that you've given, and everything that you're going to accomplish in those who are the called according to your purpose. And we give you all praise and adoration tonight in the precious name of Jesus. And the church says, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.